The Jewel of Seven Stars by Bram Stoker. Chapter Two Strange Instructions. Superintendent Dolan went quietly to the door. By a sort of natural understanding, he had taken possession of affairs in the room. The rest of us waited. He opened the door a little way and then, with a gesture of manifest relief, threw it wide, and a young man stepped in. A young man, clean-shaven, tall and slight, with an eagle face and bright, quick eyes that seemed to take in everything around him at a glance. As he came in, the superintendent held out his hand. The two men shook hands warmly. "'I came at once, sir, the moment I got your message.' I am glad I still have your confidence. That you'll always have, said the superintendent heartily. I have not forgotten our old Bow Street days, and I never shall. Then, without a word of preliminary, he began to tell everything he knew up to the moment of the newcomer's entry. Sergeant Daw asked a few questions, a very few, when it was necessary for his understanding of circumstances or the relative positions of persons, but as a rule Dolan, who knew his work thoroughly, forestalled every query and explained all necessary matters as he went on. Sergeant Daw threw occasionally swift glances around him, now at one of us, now at the room or some part of it, now at the wounded man lying senseless on the sofa. When the superintendent had finished, the sergeant turned to me and said, "'Perhaps you remember me, sir. I was with you in that Hoxton case.' "'I remember you very well,' I said as I held out my hand. The superintendent spoke again. "'You understand, Sergeant Daw, that you are put in full charge of this case.' "'Under you, I hope, sir,' he interrupted. The other shook his head and smiled as he said, "'It seems to me that this is a case that will take all a man's time and his brains. I have other work to do, but I shall be more than interested, and if I can help in any possible way I shall be glad to do so.' "'All right, sir,' said the other, accepting his responsibility with a sort of modified salute, Straight away he began his investigation. First he came over to the doctor, and, having learned his name and address, asked him to write a full report which he could use, and which he could refer to headquarters if necessary. Dr. Winchester bowed gravely as he promised. Then the sergeant approached me and said sotto voce, "'I like the look of your doctor.' I think we can work together. Turning to Miss Trelawney, he asked, Please let me know what you can of your father, his ways of life, his history, in fact of anything of whatsoever kind which interests him, or in which he may be concerned. I was about to interrupt to tell him what she had already said of her ignorance in all matters of her father and his ways, but her warning hand was raised to me pointedly, and she spoke herself. "'Alas, I know little or nothing. Superintendent Dolan and Mr. Ross know already all I can say.' "'Well, ma'am, we must be content to do what we can,' said the officer genially. "'I'll begin by making a minute examination. You say that you were outside the door when you heard the noise?' I was in my room when I heard the queer sound. Indeed, it must have been the early part of whatever it was which woke me. I came out of my room at once. Father's door was shut, and I could see the whole landing and the upper slopes of the staircase. No one could have left by the door unknown to me, if that is what you mean. That is just what I do mean, miss. If everyone who knows anything will tell me as well as that, we shall soon get to the bottom of this. He then went over to the bed, looked at it carefully, and asked, Has the bed been touched? Not to my knowledge, said Miss Trelawney, 
"'But I shall ask Mrs. Grant, the housekeeper,' she added as she rang the bell. Mrs. Grant answered it in person. "'Come in,' said Miss Trelawney. "'These gentlemen want to know, Mrs. Grant, if the bed has been touched.' "'No by me, ma'am.' "'Then,' said Miss Trelawney, turning to Sergeant Daw, "'it cannot have been touched by anyone. "'Either Mrs. Grant or I myself was here all the time, "'and I do not think any of the servants who came when I gave the alarm "'were near the bed at all. "'You see, Father lay here just under the great safe, "'and everyone crowded round him. "'We sent them all away in a very short time.' Daw, with a motion of his hand, asked us all to stay at the other side of the room, whilst with a magnifying glass he examined the bed, taking care as he moved each fold of the bedclothes to replace it in exact position. Then he examined with his magnifying glass the floor beside it, taking especial pains where the blood had trickled over the side of the bed, which was of heavy red wood handsomely carved inch by inch, down on his knees, carefully avoiding any touch with the stains on the floor, he followed the blood marks over to the spot, close under the great safe, where the body had lain. All around and about this spot he went for a radius of some yards, but seemingly did not meet with anything to arrest special attention. Then he examined the front of the safe, round the lock, and along the bottom and top of the double doors, more especially at the places of their touching in front. Next he went to the windows, which were fastened down with the hasps. "'Were the shutters closed?' he asked Miss Trelawney in a casual way, as though he expected the negative answer, which came. All this time Dr. Winchester was attending to his patient, now dressing the wounds in the wrist or making minute examination all over the head and throat and over the heart. More than once he put his nose to the mouth of the senseless man and sniffed. Each time he did so he finished up by unconsciously looking round the room as though in search of something. Then we heard the deep strong voice of the detective, so far as I can see, the object was to bring that key to the lock of the safe. There seems to be some secret in the mechanism that I am unable to guess at, though I served a year in Chubbs before I joined the police. It is a combination lock of seven letters, but there seems to be a way of locking even the combination. It is one of Chatwood's. I shall call at their place and find out something about it. Then, turning to the doctor, as though his own work were for the present done, he said, "'Have you anything you can tell me at once, doctor, which will not interfere with your full report? If there is any doubt, I can wait, but the sooner I know something definite, the better.' Dr. Winchester answered at once. "'For my own part, I see no reason in waiting. I shall make a full report, of course.' But in the meantime I shall tell you all I know, which is after all not very much, and all I think, which is less definite. There is no wound on the head which could account for the state of stupor in which the patient continues. I must, therefore, take it that either he has been drugged or is under some hypnotic influence. So far as I can judge, he has not been drugged at least by means of any drug of whose qualities I am aware. Of course, there is ordinarily in this room so much of a mummy smell that it is difficult to be certain about anything having a delicate aroma. I dare say that you have noticed the peculiar Egyptians' scents, bitumen, nard, aromatic gums and spices and so forth. It is quite possible that somewhere in this room amongst the curios and hidden by stronger scents, is some substance or liquid which may have the effect we see. It is possible that the patient has taken some drug, 
and that he may in some sleeping phase have injured himself. I do not think this is likely, and circumstances other than noise which I have myself been investigating may prove that this surmise is not correct. But in the meantime it is possible, and must, till it be disproved, be kept within our purview. Here Sergeant Daw interrupted. That may be, but if so, we should be able to find the instrument with which the wrist was injured. There would be marks of blood somewhere. Exactly so, said the doctor, fixing his glasses as though preparing for an argument. But if it be that the patient has used some strange drug, it may be one that does not take effect at once. As we are as yet ignorant of its potentialities, if, indeed, the whole surmise is correct at all, we must be prepared at all points. Here Miss Trelawney joined in the conversation. That would be quite right, so far as the action of the drug was concerned. But according to the second part of your surmise, the wound may have been self-inflicted, and this after the drug had taken effect. True! said the detective and the doctor simultaneously. She went on. As, however, doctor, your guess does not exhaust the possibilities, we must bear in mind that some other variant of the same root idea may be correct. I take it, therefore, that our first search, to be made on this assumption, must be for the weapon with which the injury was done to my father's wrist. "'Perhaps he put the weapon in the safe before he became quite unconscious,' said I, giving voice foolishly to a half-formed thought. "'That could not be,' said the doctor quickly. "'At least I think it could hardly be,' he added cautiously with a brief bow to me. "'You see, the left hand is covered with blood, but there is no blood mark whatever on the safe.' "'Quite right,' I said, and there was a long pause. The first to break the silence was the doctor. We shall want a nurse here as soon as possible, and I know the very one to suit. I shall go at once to get her if I can. I must ask that till I return some of you will remain constantly with the patient. It may be necessary to remove him to another room later on but in the meantime he is best left here. Miss Trelawney, may I take it that either you or Mrs. Grant will remain here, not merely in the room, but close to the patient, and watchful of him, till I return? She bowed in reply and took a seat beside the sofa. The doctor gave her some directions as to what she should do in case her father should become conscious before his return. The next to move was Superintendent Dolan, who came close to Sergeant Daw, as he said, "'I had better return now to the station, unless, of course, you should wish me to remain for a while.' He answered, "'Is Johnny Wright still in your division?' "'Yes. Would you like him to be with you?' The other nodded reply. "'Then I will send him on to you as soon as can be arranged. "'He shall then stay with you as long as you wish. "'I will tell him that he is to take his instructions entirely from you.' "'The sergeant accompanied him to the door, saying as he went, "'Thank you, sir. You are always thoughtful for men who are working with you. "'It is a pleasure to me to be with you again. "'I shall go back to Scotland Yard and report to my chief. Then I shall call at Chatwood's, and I shall return here as soon as possible. I suppose I may take it, miss, that I may put up here for a day or two, if required? It may be some help, or possibly some comfort to you, if I am about, until we unravel this mystery. I shall be very grateful to you. He looked keenly at her for a few seconds before he spoke again. Before I go, have I permission to look about your father's table and desk? There might be something which would give us a clue, 
or a lead at all events. Her answer was so unequivocal as almost to surprise him. You have the fullest possible permission to do anything which may help us in this dreadful trouble, to discover what it is that is wrong with my father, or which may shield him in the future. He began at once a systematic search of the dressing table, and after that of the writing table in the room. In one of the drawers he found a letter, sealed. This he brought at once across the room and handed to Miss Trelawney. "'A letter, directed to me, and in my father's hand,' she said as she eagerly opened it. I watched her face as she began to read, but seeing at once that Sergeant Daw kept his keen eyes on her face, unflinchingly watching every flitting expression, I kept my eyes henceforth fixed on his. When Miss Trelawney had read her letter through, I had in my mind a conviction which, however, I kept locked in my own heart. Amongst the suspicions in the mind of the detective was one, rather perhaps potential than definite, of Miss Trelawney herself. For several minutes Miss Trelawney held the letter in her hand with her eyes downcast, thinking. Then she read it carefully again. This time the varying expressions were intensified, and I thought I could easily follow them. When she had finished the second reading, she paused again. Then, though with some reluctance, she handed the letter to the detective. He read it eagerly, but with unchanging face, read it a second time, and then handed it back with a bow. She paused a little again, and then handed it to me. As she did so, she raised her eyes to mine for a single moment appealingly. A swift blush spread over her pale cheeks and forehead. With mingled feelings I took it, but... All said I was glad. She did not show any perturbation in giving the letter to the detective. She might not have shown any to anyone else. But to me, I feared to follow the thought further, but read on, conscious that the eyes of both Miss Trelawney and the detective were fixed on me. My dear daughter, I want you to take this letter as an instruction absolute and imperative, and admitting of no deviation whatsoever, in case anything untoward or unexpected by you or by others should happen to me. If I should be suddenly and mysteriously stricken down, either by sickness, accident, or attack, you must follow these directions implicitly. If I am not already in my bedroom when you are made cognizant of my state, I am to be brought there as quickly as possible. Even should I be dead, my body is to be brought there. Thenceforth, until I am either conscious and able to give instructions on my own account, or buried, I am never to be left alone, not for a single instant." From nightfall to sunrise, at least two persons must remain in the room. It will be well that a trained nurse be in the room from time to time, and will note any symptoms, either permanent or changing, which may strike her. My solicitors, Marvin and Jukes, of 27B Lincoln's Inn, have full instructions in case of my death and Mr. Marvin has himself undertaken to see personally my wishes carried out. I should advise you, my dear daughter, seeing that you have no relative to apply to, to get some friend whom you can trust, to either remain within the house where instant communication can be made, or to come nightly to aid in the watching, or to be within call. Such friend may be either male or female, but, whichever it may be, there should be added one other watcher or attendant at hand of the opposite sex. 
understand that it is of the very essence of my wish that there should be, awake and exercising themselves to my purposes, both masculine and feminine intelligences. Once more, my dear Margaret, let me impress on you the need for observation and just reasoning to conclusions, howsoever strange. If I am taken ill or injured, this will be no ordinary occasion, and I wish to warn you so that your guarding may be complete. Nothing in my room, I speak of the curios, must be removed or displaced in any way or for any cause whatever. I have a special reason and a special purpose in the placing of each, so that any moving of them would thwart my plans. Should you want money or counsel in anything, Mr. Marvin will carry out your wishes, to the which he has my full instructions. Abel Trelawney I read the letter a second time before speaking, for I feared to betray myself. The choice of a friend might be a momentous occasion for me. I had already ground for hope that she had asked me to help her in the first throw of her trouble, but love makes its own doubtings, and I feared. My thoughts seemed to whirl with lightning rapidity, and in a few seconds a whole process of reasoning became formulated. I must not volunteer to be the friend that the father advised his daughter to have to aid her in her vigil, and yet that one glance had a lesson which I must not ignore. Also, did not she, when she wanted help, send to me, to me a stranger, except for one meeting at a dance and one brief afternoon of companionship on the river? Would it not humiliate her to make her ask me twice? Humiliate her? No. That pain I could at all events save her. It is not humiliation to refuse. So, as I handed her back the letter, I said, I know you will forgive me, Miss Trelawney, if I presume too much. But if you'll permit me to aid in the watching, I shall be proud. Though the occasion is a sad one, I shall be so far happy to be allowed the privilege. Despite her manifest and painful effort at self-control, the red tide swept her face and neck. Even her eyes seemed suffused, and in stern contrast with her pale cheeks when the tide had rolled back. She answered in a low voice, I shall be very grateful for your help. Then, in an afterthought, she added, "'But you must not let me be selfish in my need. I know you have many duties to engage you, and though I shall value your help highly, most highly, it would not be fair to monopolize your time.' "'As to that,' I answered at once, "'my time is yours. I can for today easily arrange my work so that I can come here in the afternoon and stay till morning. After that, if the occasion still demands it, I can so arrange my work that I shall have more time still at my disposal. She was much moved. I could see the tears gather in her eyes, and she turned away her head. The detective spoke. I am glad you will be here, Mr. Ross. I shall be in the house myself, as Miss Trelawney will allow me if my people in Scotland Yard will permit. That letter seems to put a different complexion on everything, though the mystery remains greater than ever. If you can wait here an hour or two, I shall go to headquarters, and then to the safe-makers. After that I shall return, and you can go away easier in your mind, for I shall be here. When he had gone, we too— Miss Trelawney and I, remained in silence. At last she raised her eyes and looked at me for a moment. After that I would not have exchanged places with a king. 
For a while she busied herself round the extemporized bedside of her father. Then, asking me to be sure not to take my eyes off him till she returned, she hurried out. In a few minutes she came back with Mrs. Grant and two maids and a couple of men, who bore the entire frame and furniture of a light iron bed. This they proceeded to put together and to make. When the work was completed and the servants had withdrawn, she said to me, "'It will be well to be all ready when the doctor returns. He will surely want to have father put to bed, and a proper bed will be better for him than the sofa.' She then got a chair close beside her father and sat down watching him. I went about the room, taking accurate note of all I saw. And truly there were enough things in the room to evoke the curiosity of any man, even though the attendant circumstances were less strange. The whole place, excepting those articles of furniture necessary to a well-furnished bedroom, was filled with magnificent curios, chiefly Egyptian. As the room was of immense size, there was opportunity for the placing of a large number of them, even if, as with these, they were of huge proportions. Whilst I was still investigating the room, there came the sound of wheels on the gravel outside the house. There was a ring at the hall door, and a few minutes later, after a preliminary tap at the door and an answering, Come in, Dr. Winchester entered, followed by a young woman in the dark dress of a nurse. I have been fortunate, he said as he came in. I found her at once and free. Miss Trelawney, this is Nurse Kennedy. End of chapter 2 Recording by Roger Moline